So welcome to this week's episode of Leaders on a Mission, where I'm joined by inspiring leaders driven by the impact of creating a healthy and sustainable world. Now, in today's episode, I'm joined by Tony Padgett, is a business executive with real deep experience across agriculture, you know, currently acting as an advisor to a number of ag and food tech companies. And Tony, um, look, really appreciate, thanks for agreeing to come on the show today and share some of your kind of wisdom and expertise. Looking forward to our conversation. Thanks, Simon. Uh, pleasure, pleasure. So maybe I'll start at the beginning, Tony, like, uh, you know, just your, you think about your upbringing and think about some of the key forces that really help shape your kind of main influences, as it were. You know, what, what, what does that look like? Well, I think uh, I grew up in a family that was a farming family generally and spent my summers uh, on my grandfather's tobacco and cattle farm. And that really was probably the most interesting way to spend a childhood. And he was a great guy. My uncles were all uh, very good teachers and uh, my dad. And so we, we had a, you know, my sisters and I had an idyllic childhood and I had this uh, romantic image of agriculture and I ended up being becoming a lawyer and uh, working in New York City and I remember my father saying to me he said someday you're going to wish you weren't there you're going to wish you were here on this tractor and uh and so it's funny the first time I had an opportunity to get into an ag business I jumped at it uh it was uh I was an international trade lawyer and I was representing some very large companies and American companies doing business in the Middle East and Africa and other places. And one of them owned a bankruptcy company. Uh, this is the, I'll try to make this as short as I can. And they, they got into trouble by uh, having the Iraqi government owe them uh, a number of millions of dollars. And they called me up, my client said, hey, can you get this money back? And I was like, wait a minute, you guys own a seed company? you know, you build power plants. And anyway, long story, that's just in the back in the day when people were doing non-core investments. So I ended up getting the money back uh, for this bankruptcy company. And my client ended up, well, I say my client, it was our firm's client, it was a really big company. Um, I was in my early thirties, you know, and just made partner a year before. And they said, we're selling this thing to a group of investors and the investors asked me to come on board. And I said, yeah, but I don't wanna be a lawyer for a bankruptcy company. <laughs> and they said, how about head of international sales? And I said, sure, but I don't really know a tomato seed from a pepper seed. I can tell you all about cattle and tobacco and, and horses, but, um, but I passed the street cred test with the, the seed company guys, cause I could drive a tractor. I guess that's what, why they accepted me. Was that, but was anyway, that I joined to move to California from Washington, D.C., packed up the wife and little baby boys and ended up um, getting into the vegetable seed business with a company called Sun Seeds. And we, it, was, it, it was a great adventure. My, my boss at the time was a British gentleman who lived in California, a great guy, really very, he's the kind of person that you can imagine following up a hill in a battle. I mean, he's one of these inspirational, uh, wonderful people. And he sent me to Provence to live, which for which I'm eternally grateful because we wanted to buy European seed companies. So here's this American who didn't speak a word of French and his family lands in Provence. And it was like a Peter Mayle book. And um, <laughs> if you're familiar with those books and uh, we ended up buying Pioneer's vegetable seed business, which was based in Holland and Spain and Italy and other places. And so we, and Israel and Turkey. And so all of a sudden we had this really nice European infrastructure. And then we added a company in Chile and a company in China and a company in India. And long story short, we turned this thing into a real winner in four and a half years. We sold it for a lot of money to Nunum's, which at the time was owned by Herxt. Uh, now it's owned by BASF, of course, during all these changes that have happened. And I was going to go work for them in Germany, which, which was a little concerning to me because I had just managed to learn really bad French. And I thought to myself, this is not going to end well, learning German. I, I, I'm not, you know, like a lot of Americans, it's not my forte to speak foreign languages. So anyway, Monsanto called me 
because of some connections my wife had to them. I think they knew about me. He's a lawyer and a seat company guy. We should, we should talk to him. And I ended up going to work for Monsanto out in Asia. And that was a great experience. Uh, I did business development for their NutraSuite, Searle Pharmaceuticals, and of course the ag business, which at the time was mostly ag chemicals. And then we added Cargill and DeKalb and, and I got involved in the seed business and they moved me back to France. And I was involved in the very early days of the Monsanto Seed Company, which was all agronomic crops, no vegetables at the time. So we did soybeans and corn and canola. And we even had a hybrid wheat company based in Cambridge, England, um, which was interesting. And so I learned all about that. That was fun. And um, after a while, I was traveling about, as anybody who's worked for these big companies knows, you end up traveling quite a bit because my main role was business development and reaching out to new customers. And so you'd be on a plane going around. I went around the world almost every month and be, would be gone for 20, 25 days a month. And I have a bunch of little kids. And so I, I quit and went on my own. So I've been on my own for about 20 years. And in that time, I've started a number of um, seed companies and also help people buy and sell seed companies and done other things um, through my consulting company, 22 North, that's just uh, what I use. And uh, so that, that's how I got into it. And I, I say to my, my sons, I say, don't make plans because you really don't know what's going to happen to you in your career. You know, things, call people, the phone rings and suddenly you're living in France buying seed companies. You know, so uh, that's how I that's how I got into this, and I'm still uh, doing this uh, in, in terms of deals and consulting. And it's a it's a fun industry. I really like it. I really like the people. Um, so it's it's been it's been interesting, and I don't intend to stop anytime soon. No, no, great. So you you you're you're right. Your father must have been proud of you and your family. I mean, having a tobacco and cattle farm right to 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 get you into the kind of agriculture kind of industry right so well, my dad my father actually said i was crazy he said you've worked all these years you're a partner in a law firm and you're going to work in a bankruptcy company what's wrong with you he, he really thought i was losing my mind and uh, it turned out to be a great deal because they gave me a little equity and i made a little money and and i got started in the ag industry but no, at first he thought, you know, he thought it was, he thought it was a foolish move, but it turned out to be fine, you know. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And also like the, the, the move to Provence. So, I mean, I've been to Provence, it's a beautiful place, but I take it at that time, most of the business you've done is in the US, right? And most of your business expertise is, is mainly US or? or no, you... no, I, I was an international trade lawyer right from the start. And even during law school at NYU in New York City, I clerked at the United Nations for two years and I'd done a lot of traveling. I'd done, I had worked as an in-house lawyer for Mobile Oils International Law Department starting when I was 25. And I lived, I traveled in Africa and Asia and I was always gone. And then when I was a lawyer, I'd ended up in, you know, Korea, Japan, all over the world. So, no, I had filled up two passports by the time I was 30. And um, so I was, I was very comfortable overseas. Yeah. Um, so that was, that was easy for me. And then, frankly, one of the interesting things about the seed industry to me at the time was how international it is. Because when you're in the seed industry, even if you're a small American company, typically you're producing your seed all over the world. Say for example, you're a tomato seed company. We would end up making seed in Vietnam, uh, Chile for the off season for the Southern hemisphere, South Africa often for the same reason. Then we do Moldavia. We do, we, we would do Spain. Sometimes we did France and we always did China at the time in India. So here's this little tiny seed company and we're producing 15 or 20 vegetable species in 30 countries around the world. It's pretty, ask anybody from the vegetable seed industry in particular, it's extremely international because you can't help it. You can't make a living trying to produce seed, especially hybrid seed when you're doing hand pollination in, in Ohio. You can't, you, can't, you can't make a living because you have to pay people too much money and, and it just won't work. You have the wrong climate, et cetera, et cetera. 
So it was a very international thing right from the start for me. Yeah, yeah. And tell me, how's your French now? How, how have you? Oh, it's terrible. My kids, uh, my kids still laugh at me. My my sons went to the Ecole Publique, you know, and I probably just said that wrong, according to them. Um, and so they, their French is fluent, and uh, their idea of a good time was following me around the house in France and listening to me speak only in the future tense one day and only in the past tense one day. So no, I'm my French is pretty terrible. But uh, I got along and French people are very nice. They were very kind and we always had a nice time and they were very forgiving. I had some really good friends who must have thought I sounded terrible, but didn't <laughs> tell me. Because um, I know I did sound terrible. But anyway, I, my friends are terrible. I mean, it's really interesting, Tony, uh, when I consider some of the positions that I work on from a global, regional perspective. And, you know, just, just from your view, you know, going to Europe, for instance, how, how does it compare business developing, buying, selling companies, you know, transacting in Europe compared to, say, the US, compared to Asia? What's your kind of, what's your take on the, the cultural kind of differences? Well, you know, it's funny you say that because uh, I found it easier to do deals cross border because, and this might sound funny, but people tend to be more polite to people they don't know as well and maybe who aren't from their culture. So if you're buying a French company and you're an American, uh, oftentimes it'll be easier HR wise and relationally wise than buying an Ohio company, buying a company in Missouri. Uh, that's been my experience. And also one of the things I learned was um, the French way of doing business. Uh, and I've done business in Italy and Holland and Germany and pretty much every European country and every Middle Eastern country. Um, the French way of doing business is remarkably similar to the American way. People work hard, they get up early, they, they, they're, they're straightforward. Um, it was pretty easy to work in France for me. Um, so I, found, I always found it interesting that doing deals in your own culture is often harder. But the, the big difference is when you're buying family businesses anywhere versus doing larger, larger deals like we would do at Monsanto. Uh, that's a different kind of way of doing business. And that's pretty much similar everywhere. But when you're buying family companies anywhere, it's hard because it's emotional. Uh, a lot of times it's a generational thing. An older person doesn't have someone to pass it on to, or the younger generation is worried and they want to, you know, get a check and get out of the business because they see they won't be able to compete or, or any number of factors. But there's, uh, there's something, the visions of sugar plums uh, problem, I call it, because people often when it emotionally uh, they've spent a lifetime or two or three generations building a company, sometimes their view of the value of the company doesn't comport with reality. And that's a tough conversation to have. You know, you have to value a business for what it's worth. And, and sometimes that's a really, that's the hardest part. Um, and the other, the other part of that that was great was that you give an opportunity to people, especially in family businesses, when, when we would buy my company being small, I wanted everybody to stay. And so we would be able to say to a, a gentleman in his 70s or early 80s or whenever, hey, why don't you stick around with us? And we'll give you more equity and we'll give you a salary and you can keep your office. And, and that almost always turned out to be a really great move. So that was fun. And it really didn't matter if the person was from Jordan or Spain or Florida or Japan or anywhere, uh, people is, in agriculture, I think, have a certain genetic similarity. Uh, if you talk to a farmer from Kenya and you talk to a farmer from Germany, you're going to have a really similar conversation. That, that, that's one of the things I've discovered in my life that I find the most fascinating. No, that's great. That really is, actually. Um, yeah, and that is fascinating. And, and what about Asia? I've always heard, like, doing business in Asia, for instance, and transacting is a lot more difficult. And it's, uh, it's compared to, like, the American way of being really direct and clear. And, uh, you know, there's a lot more kind of the unspoken language in Asia. And I'm wondering well, how you adapted I don't to know. That. I think part of that is, is sort of a mystique that's arisen around Asia, maybe because a lot of Westerners don't understand Asia. When I went out to Asia 
Um, my boss was originally from Vietnam and um, he said, you have to read this book to work for me. And I said, okay. And it was called Sons of the Yellow Emperor. And it was a book written probably a hundred years ago about the Chinese diaspora where the Chinese emperor sent Chinese envoys out to all the Asian countries about, I don't know, 1100 years ago to start colonizing, if you will. And that's why you see pockets of, of Asian Chinese families in Vietnam and Indonesia and the Philippines and everywhere else. But he said, you have to understand how Asia works to work out here. And the other thing is the, the mystique is that you have to have these old relationships and you have to know people for 30 years and all that. And I, I actually, I probably was very politically incorrect at this moment, and I'll, I'll tell you the story. I was in a meeting in Singapore at Monsanto headquarters where I was based, and you know, I was the head of business development, so I'd see people from every country in Asia. In fact, I spent most of my time out there on an airplane going to all those countries, not seeing my family. But, um, and this Chinese guy started to tell me about how it's very different out here and that we, we build all our business on relationships. And I said, just stop for a minute. I said, I'm from the Midwest, I'm from Ohio, and we're the same, you know? I mean, it, it, we, we value relationships and we think relationships are good and important. So we're not that different. So let's just pretend we're the same and let's see if we can have a business conversation. Because he was really trying to put me off, you know? Like, oh, you're not, you're, you're an American. You're not going to understand this. You have to live out here for 80 years and, and then maybe you'll figure it out. And I said, no, I said, it's really, you know, it's, it's not that different. We, we value relationships too. So I don't really buy that as much having lived out there. I think Asians in general, first of all, it's a huge area with lots of different people. You have to include New Zealanders and Chinese and Indians and Japanese in that statement. So there you go. But I think they're not too much different than the rest of the world uh, in that regard. I really don't. Yeah, no, great. Yeah, thank you for that. And you've clearly been, you know, that's what I love about your experience. You know, you've been around the globe. You've really, you know, lived and breathed and done business in the, uh, in the, uh, you know, with lots of different cultures. Um, so that's no, great to hear some of your kind of experiences around that. I yeah, think it's funny because I've been to like, I think, I think the, the, the count is 98 countries now. And a lot of those, you know, I've been like 50 times to Jordan and probably more than that to Syria and uh, all, all countries that a lot of Americans don't get to go to. And I have extremely fond memories and good friends in all those places. And um you, you realize that we're more, I know this is going to sound like a, a sappy, but we're really a lot more alike than we're different. Because um, I've been to lots of countries that would be considered difficult places to travel or do business, and they're really not once you're in there. You know, yeah. People are nice. Yeah. Well, to tell me maybe that when you consider all your experience, what's the most difficult place where you've had to do business, where maybe there, there's been you know, a challenge in the culture or it's just taken a little, you know, where, where, where's the most challenging place? I think the most challenging places are all the places where you have to deal with government corruption. Right, okay. Um, and crime. Crime, you can kind of figure it out. You hire a bigger uh, watchdog and you buy more barbed wire. And, you know, we, we, you know, Monsanto was in South Africa in the early days when things were really, really dangerous down there. And you know you can you can deal with that with more security guards and all that. But government corruption uh, and and, and co corruption at the local level, say in the police force, um, was was really the biggest challenge. And there's some countries where it's really difficult to do business because of that. I don't want to malign any particular country yeah. uh, on 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 video, but you can imagine where that that might be. Yeah, I had. I'll tell you one kind of funny story. It's funny, sad, but I had a. We were doing business in a particular country, and my new salesman down there called me up. He said, "Hey, Tony, my truck got stolen, and I just bought him a brand new little white, you know, pickup truck." And I said, "Oh no!" And I said, "We'll call the police." He said, "No, the police stole the truck." So, <laughs> <laughs> we stuff like that happened all the time in that particular country. So. 
what do you do with that? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. But everywhere else, I mean, as long as there's the rule of law and the water works, you can turn on the tap and your electricity stays on Well, you can buy generators for some of that, but you know, everything kind of works most places. But when you layer in bribery and government corruption and people stealing your or shooting your people and all that, then it gets to the point where you think maybe we should go to another country. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, tell me when, when you, um, I think after you, working with Monsanto when you 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 I wanted to explore a little bit with Volo Agri right because you set the company up and you took it on a journey and that must have been very different from working for uh you know like a multinational right so oh yeah it was in fact you know I've been lucky Sunseeds was a little tiny company and we we you know we plugged in our own computers and we did all our own work so that was that and then I ended up at Monsanto where I had a secretary and a staff and a team and I'm like this is great. This is really fun. Uh, and it was fun. I enjoyed it. And there were some really nice people there. But then when I went back out into the world and started my own company again, um, it is different. It's, it's, I find it more fun to, to, to start these companies. And Volo Agri, we started in 2012. It's still, it's still going. I'm no longer involved in day-to-day -day stuff. I'm still a shareholder. Um, uh, but it's, uh, you know, we started with nothing but a theory that there were some really great vegetable seed germ plasm breeding companies that were available to buy that I knew of. And so we raised some money and we started buying these things. And we ended up having a company based in, you know, the main vegetable seed breeding areas of the world, which are California, the western part of Mexico, Culiacan for tomatoes and peppers, especially. And then, of course, the Holland the Dutch area for, for greenhouse, and then Southern Spain, Almeria, for the plastic house, the Marta Plastico area. And then we were in Turkey and Southern Italy. And, and so, you know, you build that and you have breeders in all those places. And it's a pretty nice little footprint. We didn't have a footprint in Asia, but the company's got a footprint in all those places. And so if you're breeding in the, say, the top eight money-making species in vegetables, um, that's, those are the places you want to be. And so that's how we did it. And we just added people. We ended up, by the time I left, I think we had 300 employees. So that's a whole different deal than, you know, having five people in a, in a, in a garage in, in outside of San Francisco. So um, it, was a, it was a fun experience. I, I enjoyed it. The, the people I admire, though, I have to say, the people I admire are these people who can make a living successfully and climb the ladder in places like Syngenta and Monsanto because they could all be president of the United States because you have to be very smart politically to make it in those big companies, I think. And I think it's a great skill to have. I, had, I, I would tell any young person to try to spend part of their career in one of those big, you know, well-run companies like Bayer or BASF or Syngenta, uh, Cargill, Lemagrain. I mean, the list goes on and on because you'll learn, you'll learn a lot about how to deal with people. And Yeah, that, that, that is very interesting. Uh, and um, I agree with you, but it wouldn't always set you up for your own entrepreneurial move though, would it? No, no. A lot of those folks, I would say, would probably panic if they didn't have the the big company logo on their check every two weeks. And I'm not criticizing that. I think it's normal human behavior to want some security like that. You have to have, as my father would say, the heart and lungs to do this. You have to, you have to be able to sit in your office someday and wonder how you're going to make the monthly payroll. And if you can't survive that kind of stress, you probably should go back and work for a big company. Yeah. Big yeah. company stress is pretty bad too. I mean, uh, you know, it, it, it's a different kind of stress. Yeah. Well, so it's a horses for courses, but um, how did you cope with that then? I mean, from, from the, the point when you were out there raising all the financing and, you know, you were literally the driver, the driving force behind the whole thing. Right. So a lot of, right. 
responsibility on your shoulders around that. So how did you cope with the adaption into something like that? And, and was that a big step for you? Well, you know, I didn't grow up in a family with money. And I think, you know, my, my dad left the ag world pretty early and he was a steel worker. And there were times when, you know, he had a roofing contracting company and there were, you know, there were lots of times when I was a kid where, you know, we weren't sure where the next meal was going to come from. And so I, to me, that was like normal life. And I think growing up the way I did, uh, it toughened you up a little bit. I mean, I had a, I had a nice childhood. We didn't suffer, but uh, I was aware that there was a wolf at the door, let's just say. And if you've grown up like that, starting a company, you know, you can ask anybody who started a company, they've had the same stories. You just deal with it. You know, every day is different. You go to bed and you think, well, maybe tomorrow it'll be better. We'll raise the money. We'll find this. We'll make a sale. And if you can't deal with that, you should go, you know, do something else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you think when you, I mean, I know, I know that, um, you know, everyone has their own experiences of, of that, for instance, of, of growing up and what that may feel like. But do you think inherently coming up and growing up in a, in a background and environment where things are tougher, you know, and you, you're witness to that. Does that give you more resilience, fire in your belly, more, more ability to be able to kind of, you know, withstand, you know, you know the, the ups and downs of that early stage environment, as it were? I, I think it's a tool. I think, I think you can use it. I, and in my case, it came in handy. I used it as a, a way of saying to myself, well, I've been through worse. We can get through this. But I, on the other hand, I went to very good schools and I went to school with a lot of uh, people who came in from very wealthy families, for example. And I have a lot of good friends from college and law school who came from rich families who are tough people, who, um, you know, they could build anything. So I don't know. I mean, it helped me. But uh, some of my friends whose fathers were extremely rich are as tough as I've ever been, maybe tougher and faster on their feet. So I, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. In my case, it was helpful for me to get through the hard times thinking about, you know, my dad and how he struggled and how he, he, he survived it. So uh, everybody's different, I guess. Yeah, no, great. And, um, and also during that time, what were the, the you are acquiring companies as such. So the people, no doubt, that you were taking on were from other companies that you needed to integrate into yours as opposed to going out, hiring lots of, right. lots of people from the street, right? Yeah, and well, you know, and I say to people, I say integration is the hardest thing. Mm -hmm. And I say never underestimate how difficult it will be to put these blocks together. Yeah. And, and, and as I said earlier in our conversation, Sometimes that's harder with two American pieces <clears throat> versus a, a French piece, an American or whatever, but never underestimate how difficult that is. And I'm not just talking about software systems. <clears throat> I'm talking about breeders talking to each other, scientists who are jealous of their germplasm who won't share germplasm, salesmen who are difficult because they don't want to share territory. Um, it's all about human behavior and you have to meet people's expectations for their career, while at the same time meeting expectations for your shareholders and your board on growing the company. Um, and sometimes there's a real tension there. Um, so that the, that's the one thing I would pay the most attention to are integration, minuscule integration issues. Do not, do not underestimate the difficulty of that. Mm. Absolutely. Tell me though, when you're buying these companies, for instance, what, what is the heart and soul of them? For instance, you talk about scientists, we talk about breeders. When you're viewing a company, what makes them, and you know, you're having a look and clearly you're looking at their portfolio and you're analyzing the quality of people they've got. Well, what is the, the sweet spot, the heartland of what makes these companies great? Well, you know, in my case, in the, the, the companies I bought, have almost all been in the seed business, right? And so the key there is the germplasm, it's the science, it's the, it's the parent lines, it's what, what the breeders have been able to develop. 
So the core of those businesses is pretty easy to figure out. It's the science, it's the breeding, it's the actual germplasm collection. And that's getting harder and harder because now with gene editing and, and all the new tools that available to people, you can start a seed company and end up licensing in gene editing and, and create some pretty interesting things without having to buy a lot of germplasm. So it's changing and I'm involved in a lot of that now and it's really interesting, but the, the, the key thing in, in when I was doing deals 20 years ago, even five, 10 years ago, is mostly just about the germplasm and uh, the value. The, the people are important. That's true. Their relationships are important. Uh, and always, that's always true. But the, the germplasm is the key. Yeah. Okay. No, got it. And I, I was going to say now, when you consider, so I've been in the ag tech space probably for about seven years now, as it were. So I'm not kind of, you know, I don't have that kind of experience of seeing where it's come from. And I, I'm working with kind of, you know, agricultural kind of trade companies whose values are soaring at the moment, right? I know. Yeah. And, um, and, and all of a sudden, I'm talking with firms that are now talking about redefining and creating whole new fruits and vegetables that have never been seen before, that are almost new categories. Uh, and it just, I, I just figure in a few years time, when we're having this chat in 10 years time or something, the, the grocery aisle is going to look pretty different, basically. I think it's, I, I love it. I think it's, I actually am more excited than ever about the future of food because we're able to overcome diseases. We're, we're, we're working on, you know, water uptake and root systems and, and being able to grow vegetables and other plants in places where you couldn't grow them before. Uh, they're, they're working on, I'm working with a, a gentleman from an Ivy League school here in the United States on reforestation of the Sahara desert and Saudi Arabia and all this is is becoming possible with 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 uh, new technology it's specifically gene editing so you can edit genes in plants to do what you want them to do and you're right there's going to be some really great I mean wouldn't everybody like a cherry without a pit I mean I would um in raspberries that last longer in the refrigerator and tomatoes that taste like your granddad's backyard tomato, even though you get it at the, at the, you know, the grocery store. So all that's going to be possible. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. I think when you look at the world, when you look at the explosion of kind of snacking and how much time we actually have, you know, to be yeah. able to consume our food um, and how much time we have is about time we got a little bit more healthy snacking options, isn't it? As one option. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, well, you're seeing companies uh, doing that with like, you see the small carrots that are now ubiquitous in every kid's lunchbox uh, in Europe and the United States. And, you know, habits are changing. It's all about healthy snacking. You know what it's like in, in your country and, and the rest of Europe and, and here it's it's definitely a, a different world and yeah. it's possible because of this the technology of growing these plants with new new methods yeah yeah absolutely it, well you know it's uh, clearly in europe we have issues with some of the kind of gene editing um you know laws over here hopefully uh, you know but certainly in america and other countries it's uh, you know some really good adoption and uh and uh it seems that the, maybe, I don't know, the timing might be a little bit different from over the last 10, 20 years. It just seems that the drivers of sustainability are so embedded now in the consumer and the, you know, they're really high on a lot of people's list, essentially. And uh, that's almost helping drive the choice or, you know, maybe even seeing, seeing that the technology can, can, can help drive that that story forward really. yeah I, I was involved last year in advising on the sale of a very large company that was in the fruit business and uh, as part of a team we were helping them figure out how to position themselves and the market and where it was headed and this and that and so we did commission some studies and I, I participated in these studies about 
people's attitudes about healthy eating, about sustainability, about GMO, about gene editing. And it was pretty remarkable that the younger you go on the, the chart, so folks that are under 35 were more concerned with sustainability. It was more top of mind, but uh, everybody now has gotten the message about healthy eating. And so these messages are, are resonating and it's driving, you know, it's driving everything. Um, and, and, and there's going to be a place for organic. There's going to be a place for, well, GMO is, is sort of a narrow area. There haven't really been that many GMO events when you, when you look at it. The main ones are Roundup Ready and VT. And everything else now, for the most part, is coming out of the gene editing world, not the, not the GMO world. And that has been accepted more broadly. Of course, in Europe, it's still, you know, they're still holding to gene editing is no different than GMO. I think that'll eventually change uh, just because they're going to have to probably to stay competitive and to be able to import food, frankly, because every the rest of the world is, is going with gene editing. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the thing that's driving it is the other thing about gene editing is you can engineer uh, plants to produce in places where they haven't been able to before. So if you're, if you're worried about feeding the world and increasing production and yield and overcoming disease and overcoming problems like, you know, the Cavendish banana disappearing because there's only one type of banana that most of us eat and it's getting a disease that's going to kill that particular type a banana that's a big problem but all of those can be solved with gene editing uh and you know if you want to feed the world you're going to have to use all the tools uh from organic all the way to gene editing and from indoor farming to vertical farming to dutch greenhouses to open field there's a place for all of it uh, it's very exciting and uh, do you like the have you always enjoyed that technology component or is that something that's been more prevalent now over the last five years or so is, is uh... no I've always enjoyed it because that, that's what drove the hybrid seed business you know that's what drove uh, people adopting hybrid seed over open pollinated seed was the technology used to breed hybrid parents and or hybrid seed and, and make a better plant for example when I first started in the early 90s the, the majority of tomatoes grown and peppers grown in the Middle East and North Africa were still open pollinated, you know, old fashioned, you know, air pollinated, bee pollinated plants like our ancestors planted a thousand years ago. And uh, when I went into the Middle East, I would drop off these packets of, of uh, hybrid tomatoes and I would say, listen, you're getting 12 tomatoes for one determinate plant here in, you know, Damascus. But if you plant this, I promise you, you'll get 60 or 65 tomatoes off of every plant. You know, that makes the salesman's job easy. And, uh, and sure enough, they would plant these hybrids and they would see the difference, the better quality, better for shipping, better taste, disease resistance, which is huge. And so, no, I was, I've always been interested in the technology of it because the technology works. I mean, we've changed the world of growing food with technology. Um, it's remarkable what's happened in the last 40, 50 years in not just row crops, but vegetable crops. Um, you know, there are whole parts of the world where you probably wouldn't have been able to grow tomatoes now because of white flies and other vectors and other issues. But, you know, technologies overcome all this. And until recently, all the technology used to overcome these problems in vegetables was good old fashioned Gregor Mendel type plant breeding. Of course, you're using molecular markers and you're using all the tools available, but mostly you're still selecting parents and crossing and getting a good result. So, I mean, Gregor Mendel would have been really comfortable in most seed companies up until about a year ago because they were doing what he was doing with peas. Um, but the, uh, now with gene editing, it's it's like everybody has a rocket booster and you can, you can, nothing is impossible. You know, you can really think about changing 
Some things are harder, like for example, the shape of a vegetable is harder to change. It'll take a little longer than say the color or even the flavor is easier than shape. So there's some things that are more difficult, but it's all possible. Yeah, and I wonder if gene ed we're just at the beginning of something with gene editing, you know, and um, when you think about yeah. Yeah. maybe other technologies that will, you know, rival it or even be better than it and who knows i mean it's uh you know it's uh it, it, it's, it's such an exciting time and it's sounds- I'm, I'm i'm optimistic I, I i don't worry about feeding the world i think we're going to be able to feed the world yeah that's that, that's the point i was going to mention another two billion people i think by 2050 right that's a lot right. of people but uh it's uh you you're you're confident you, you feel that we've got enough in the armory to be able to do that? I think so. I mean, the big problem will be politics and distribution. I mean, if, if you if you, if you take away the problem of distribution, uh, you can already pretty much feed the world. The problem is vegetables weigh a lot because they're mostly water. And so transporting things is expensive. So it all comes back to trying to do more local production rather than shipping things across the ocean or things like, because it's heavy, tomatoes are heavy. Um, it's mostly water and that's very expensive. The other thing is I think uh, storage and refrigeration are big challenges in places like Asia and Africa, uh, the Middle East. You, you, got, you have to think about basic things like, do you have enough refrigerated storage in India when you need it or Pakistan or wherever? Um, but if you, if you can solve those technological problem, technical problems, uh, the, the means of producing the food and the means of cleaning water and, and, and all of that, that's, that's being improved um, on a daily basis by technology. The one that I would love to see happen sooner is desalinization because the fresh water issue is key. It's critical. It's, it's, a, it's a big, big problem. But if we can crack desalinization, <coughs> that's a different one. That's a different world. That'll be that'll be good. Yeah, yeah. And well, there's certainly a, a big focus on it, and there's no shortage of companies trying to solve that problem or coming up yeah. with solutions around it. But uh, oh, Tony, I could talk to you all day about this. It's uh, it's been brilliant getting you on the show and hearing your stories and your expertise and your knowledge. So really appreciate your time today. Really enjoyed the chat with you. Been a pleasure, Simon.